Hello and welcome to Monday's episode of the Terrace Scottish Football Podcast. My name is Robert Borthwick, a name you won't have heard on this podcast for quite a while. Um, Fella keeps me away from it for reasons that only he knows, to be honest with you. Uh, but listen, that's fine. I've been allowed out to play uh, on this Monday evening, so uh, I'm back, baby. And I'm joined by the man who um, brutally keeps me away from football-related podcasts and just put me on the funny ones. It's Craig Fowler. <laughs> You'll be allowed back as long as you behave yourself. Uh, well, there's absolutely no promises of that. And it's not what the people want to hear either. Uh, you know, I'd... I'd, I'd <laughs> I see the Discord. I, I see what people say on on the internet. They want laughs. They want banter, uh, and that's what I'll hopefully be able to provide today. When I basically grovel and apologise to Aberdeen fans in the first section of this podcast for mm. saying that uh, I'd, I'd laugh if they went down, but I think that's a fair comment. Um, yeah, I, I had a lot of people in my in my DMs and my mentions, uh, all from a, a sort of AB postcode um, saying, "How dare you laugh at something that is objectively funny?" It would objectively be funny if if they went down. So. <laughs> Listen, we are mm-hmm. we are where we are. Yeah, we're on the the new the newish format of the the, the Monday show. I think yeah. it's fair to say. Um, it's, I know that that people online uh, have been saying, "Can you not just talk about the six games equally?" And frankly, no, no, uh, we, we we don't want to. Uh, we want to do this instead because we <laughs> think it's better. There's no time for that. There's no time to to watch six games. There, there's no <laughs> there's no time in a working week to watch six games of football when you have a full time job. Um, but we we'll, we'll go through what we, we've kind of done previously on these on these shows. I enjoyed the one a couple of weeks ago when Graham Thewlis was uh, despising his own life, uh, but then had to talk for fifty eight minutes about Scottish football. Thankfully, I'm I'm not hating my life quite as much, so maybe this will be a laugh. We'll start off with the the main match focus, and and kind of as we were saying there, um, we will go for Aberdeen against Ross County uh, as the, the the focus match. I think it's fair enough. It was a huge game down the bottom end, a real six pointer at Pataudry, um at the weekend. And, and Craig, Aberdeen came out of that 2-1 winners um, and it really just solidifies the thought that why on earth did they get Neil Warnock in when <laughs> Peter Levin could have basically just got them to a reasonable enough position already? Well, I'm not going to defend Neil Warnock, but you know when Warnock left and he was kind of saying, and I think he'd said that the game before the Kelly match as well, that they weren't that far away from getting points that would be would have been valuable to them to kind of have halt the slide and to stop any talk of Aberdeen going down. And so I think we'll be we be talking about the Motherwell game where you know they did go three 0 down, but then they came back, got to three each, had a goal disallowed that you kind of thought was maybe going to be allowed, and that probably would have won that game four three. There was obviously the St Mirren game where they chucked it away in injury time and they looked fairly comfortable before then. I think there was maybe one other he was alluded to when he was like, well, yeah, we were close to getting some points, it just kind of fell away in the end. And I think it's this in the Motherwell game shows why it was probably a bit. We were certainly hopeful of Aberdeen going down, but why it was parallels with Hibs and other teams weren't quite there because there's just enough talent in the squad and with guys like Graham Shinney, just kind of enough leadership that they were just going to be able to pull some results out of the bag because that's all they've done, really. They're not any better. They're actually not any better. I've watched the Motherwell game and I've watched this game. They're still shit. They still are really poor for considering the talent they've got throughout that squad. But it was just going to be a matter of time before things started to break their way. And I think that's just what's happening. Because in this game, for 65 minutes, County were the better side. Aberdeen were the better side for the last half hour, I would say. But for the first 65 minutes, County were the better side. And when I saw the scoreline after the, the game, because I was at the Hearts game, so I didn't know anything about what had happened. Just saw the scoreline at full time. I didn't think that's how it would have played out, but it certainly was. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely spot on. It's it's the individual talents within the squad that that are going to pull them through. And listen, that is absolutely what you need when you're in this part of a season when you've had a, a, an absolute nightmare in the months previous. You need guys like Bojan Miofsky getting back on the goal trail, mm-hmm. which he did in this game. Jamie McGrath has, has kind of been a, a, a shining light, really, for Aberdeen uh, quite a lot this season. He's been able to to put in moments of individual brilliance, individual quality that's been able to get them over the line in certain games. And, and you know, if he's utilised correctly, i.e. not at wing-back, then he can absolutely offer Or even right things. wing, I would say, as he was in this game. Or even right wing. But he, he can offer and he can provide. And I, I think that Junior Hoylett as well has, has been fine, you know, since he's come in. He's, he's adding a little bit more in terms of creativity and he's allowing Aberdeen to get up the park and create these opportunities. So... Yeah, listen, it's what you need in games like this. But I think that even looking at the Ross County side again, Simon Murray scoring again, a good performance. Mm. Yeah, they didn't get the result, but you're beginning to feel like they might be okay, especially under Don Cowie, which they've really done well since he came uh, came into the club at the 
at the helm in the sort of interim position. Yeah, then just before I go to County, let me just finish off your, your Aberdeen point there because somebody you didn't mention was Duke. And Duke, yeah. not had a good season by any stretch of the imagination. Real, real disappointment after how good he was last campaign for Aberdeen. But he came off the bench in this one and I thought he was the best player after he came off the bench. He was... Not only did he make the goal, but he was really threatening and he helped. Him and Paul Vara coming off, uh, coming off the subs bench really kind of gave Aberdeen a lift and, and kind of managed to hold the game back in their favour. But, and that kind of segues nicely into County, there was, I, I, do agree, I do agree with your overall point and that you look at them and you look at St. Johnson and you think County are trending in the right direction under C- Cowie. I was going to say County again there. That's why I, that's why I stopped. <laughs> Don, 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 Don County. Don County. <laughs> Ross County. <laughs> but yeah, they're trending in the right direction and St. Johnson under Craig Levine are obviously trending in the wrong direction and we'll, we'll come on to them very soon. But it, it was still a weird... So I don't know what you make of this. So in the first half, County lined up in a 3-4-3 three, 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 with two number 10s in Jan Danda and Josh Sims playing off of Simon Murray. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I would have thought they would have went for Jordan White. And then the first half happened, and I was like, County are looking really good here. They are passing the ball very well through the lines. Aberdeen's midfield of Shinny, Barron, and Clarkson, you think would be best at kind of dealing with that? They're the kind of the most tenacious three they could probably put together with maybe Killian Phillips instead of Clarkson. I thought that's still enough kind of ball winning. They're not, it doesn't look like a midfield they should be bullied by, put it that way. I mean, it's Latori and Connor Randall who are... Not exactly monsters themselves. And yet County just found it really easy to go from defence to midfield to attack. And they were creating a number of opportunities in the final third and maybe should have created more kind of clear-cut opportunities with the spaces they got into. But I was thinking, that's a very impressive performance. Second half starts. And so I like, watched this back on y so it just immediately cuts to the second half. And it was like, after a minute, I was like, is that Jordan White? What's, what's, what's happened here? Why is Jordan White on the park? And I couldn't see anything to suggest that Sims was, was injured. It just, it, 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 well, it was hard because I was, I was looking for it, but Ross County fans don't seem to exist online. <laughs> the only we've, got, com- we've, got, we've got Mark McDonald. Yeah, surely. I, I should have just asked there. him, actually. I should have just, <laughs> just messaged him. But I was like looking through like the Pi and Bovril forum. There was only like one County fan who said anything. The County thread has been updated since last week. And the Ross County Fans Forum itself. They're the only club in the top flight without a dedicated fans forum because it shut down a couple of years ago because nobody was using it. Is that it? Have, have, have smartphones not gone as far as Dingwall? Do they have to go to internet cafes to do this and they just can't be bothered? Is this, is this what's happening? Because I couldn't figure out if it was an injury because if it's an injury, yeah, fair enough. That's maybe your, your best choice, but it, it basically changed how they played because White came on, it was more two up top and they just started going long. But on the other hand, until Aberdeen made their own changes, I still kind of thought it was working. I thought it it asked Aberdeen a different question. I thought, this looks like it's maybe even thrown Aberdeen off a bit more and that they were kind of, like, maybe surprised at how County played in the first half and then they were surprised again how they played in the second. But then I thought maybe once Aberdeen got to grips with things, County missed the fact that they then were able to kind of go through the lines. And it especially didn't help that he made two further subs, bringing off Randall and Danda, and brought on Keela and Sheaf. And then after that, I was just like, no, nah. Aberdeen are, are, are definitely the better team at this point. So it was a weird one. I don't know if Cowie was, yeah, possibly overthinking things, or, I mean, you can, you can see the logic in it, because Aberdeen sent a half, and Gatterman and Jensen are both pretty soft. And White did win a number of headers and make the ball stick, but it was, it was, a, it was a strange thing. That I don't think you would see a lot of managers doing when they would play so well in the first half. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to go back to your initial point about um, Dingwall being some sort of Silent Hill scenario, like it's paired with Silent Hill. So whenever you go there, <laughs> just big horns come on and uh, and ash starts falling from the ground and you can't get in touch with anyone. Um, but no, you're right. And I think that Don Cowie, he's a young guy going into his first managerial role and he probably will overthink things and he will make mistakes. And this is probably just an element of that happening. You know, like you say, Ross County were, were probably the better team in the first half, but they were also losing. You know, they were one down, so they're, they're looking at, right, okay, well, maybe we do need to change something here. Maybe we need to, you know, strike while the iron's hot and, and put the big guy up front. And then obviously, you know, like you say, 
if Neil Warnock has been saying how Jensen and Gartman are soft as, then obviously opposition managers are going to mm-hmm. be like, hmm, let's get a big guy or a, or a Simon Murray just sprinting at them and, and see how they deal with it. But maybe, Aberdeen, they, I think, maybe, maybe they saw Simon Murray equalised from a header in the first half. It's like, well, if we have Jordan White in there as well, then we're just going to win all the headers. We're going to win this game. Um, no, exactly. And I think that it's, it's, it is indicative of, of a, a young manager just basically maybe thinking like, right, okay, I need to do this. When in actual fact, you just give it an extra five minutes and, and see how you get on and, and go mm. from there. In terms of Aberdeen, this feels like a, a, a real marker in the sand for them. Uh, obviously, they got a positive result before the international break as well. They come back, they get this result, and, and it's beginning to feel like things are, are turning in the right direction, even if it's just in, in terms of a mentality. You know, just winning a couple of games and, and seeing that you can get points on the board and and actually given that actual sort of like tangible gap now between them and your Ross Counties and your St. Johnstons, they can maybe start to breathe a little bit easier and think, right, soldier through to the end of this season. And then, mm. you know, whenever a manager is announced, might be at like Christmas time, I don't know, uh, whenever they actually <laughs> get someone in the door, they can start to work towards, you know, building something positive again. Because like we said, there's so much individual quality in that squad that's signed up for a good, you know, couple of years as well. You know, yeah. it's not as if it's guys that, that you're just able to get rid of easily in the summer. And um, they'll be looking at this and saying, right, they need to get someone in that can actually fulfill the quality of the squad. It still feels like something's not quite right about Aberdeen. But yeah, just just getting the victories was just huge. Just keeps them away from any kind of possible threat of like relegation, like immediate. So like... They could end up back in it again if they go on tail, another tailspin, but it just seems very unlikely at this point. And ah, it just kind of feels like it's a bit of a rest of development at, at this point. They need, they, need a, they need a permanent manager coming in, somebody good to to basically get get the squad back into shape again. They're not like a million miles away. They need a bit more, need a bit more presence in the middle of the park. They probably need another decent wide player and they need to sort out the centre-halves. But there's obviously still a lot of talent in that squad. And they really should be doing a lot better than they've shown this season. Uh, Speaking of doing a lot better, before we move on, we really need to mention Aberdeen's opener. No, no, I, I was just going to say huge David Moyes at Man United vibes about that. Uh, what do you need to work on? Passing, <laughs> passing, tackling and shooting. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> football, we need to work on football. <laughs> yeah, it's actually quite a big list. Um, the opening goal, yes, please, please. Um, let's, let's, let's talk about that. It's, it's actually, you know, we will talk about Livingston Celtic. Uh, but it's like, is it the most comical goal in the top flight this weekend? I think it's not the most comical. The, the, I, th- I think you're talking about the first Celtic goal because that was, a, yeah, that was a, a just kind of ball bouncing everywhere around the penalty area and eventually going in off of Jimmy Brandon's plucks. But yeah, this this one made this this one made no sense. It just didn't make any sense how the ball ended up underneath the crossbar and in the back of the net. One of the most overused phrases in football is somebody or usually a team bottling it. Like, if it's just a big game or something and a team lose it, then they've bottled it. And it's like, it's not necessarily so. Somebody has to lose the game. It doesn't mean that, like the team's bottles crashed. It doesn't mean that they've kind of, they've shot themselves. It doesn't mean that they've just kind of lost all composure or whatever. It just means they've been beaten. This is an instance of somebody bottling it because he is on the line. He knows that if he fucks it up, that it's going to be a goal. They're, they're in a precarious position. They're not won many games this season. They're away from home, Aberdeen. It's a huge game. If they win this, they draw Aberdeen back in it as well. It's massive. I think pretty much in the flash of a second, all that goes through his head as he goes to swipe that and he makes a complete arse of it and it goes into the roof of the net. It's incredible. It's not even going... Miofsky's shot isn't even going at much speed. It's unbelievable. He can actually just stop it with his foot and dribble it away. Like that's that's how slow it's going. Instead, it ends up in the, in the roof, the roof of the net. He roofs it. Brilliant. It's like the, the the like an example of the worst possible moment to remember that you've left the house unlocked. Like it's like that sort of like this. It's hit him at that exact second, and he's like, "Oh Jesus Christ!" And then all of a sudden, it's in the back of the net. Yeah, it, it, honestly, it's almost. You know how you see things as like um, conspiracy theorists online saying, is this match fixed? It kind of looks like that. It was such a bad mistake that it's like he must have intended that. But at the same time, how can you intend to flick the ball over your own head <laughs> off the crossbar and into the back of the net? I, honestly, I thought it was a brass neck that Mayovsky was claiming that. I'd give that as an own goal every day of the week. <laughs> Suppose yes, it, it was a. Suppose it counts because it was on target. It was a quote unquote shot on target, but no, I'm, I'm sorry. When something is that glaring, I think that has to go down as a, a, an own goal. It should. It, absolutely remarkable stuff. Anyway, that was us saying something nasty. Do you like saying something nice? I, I do. Well, occasionally. 
Well, th- th- you're going to have to because okay. we are going <laughs> to we are going to go into the say something nice section of the podcast. And we're going to focus on St. Johnston against Dundee. Another big game this for both sides. Obviously, St. Johnston looking to stave off the, the sort of relegation playoff spot threat and Dundee gunning for top six, knowing that Hibs were uh, at Ibrox in the last same afternoon as well. But, I mean, I, I think that we kind of have to talk about Adama Sidibe's goal here because, my goodness me, what a finish from a guy that sometimes looks like uh, he's never kicked a ball before in his life, sometimes looks like he's going to do something incredible, very rarely does, he actually did something incredible, and what a finish it is. Incredible. Like, yeah, incredible is exactly the word for it. And in, in a weekend where we had Marley Watkins go at Tynecast and we had Ravi Matondo's go at Ibrox, and neither of them were, were goal of the weekend. Like, that, that says an awful lot. To score your first goal in Scottish football, and your first goal at any kind of decent level as well, with an overhead kick and a proper kind of overhead kick, not one of those ones where it's like, not like Egert Jonsson at, at Pataudry all those years back, where it was basically kind of falling over backwards while putting your legs in the air. It was a proper acrobatic off the ground, smashing it past the goalkeeper. Beautiful stuff. But not only that, I thought he was excellent in this game. And if, on, on the one hand, you can look at this two ways. This is a really bad result for St. Johnson, considering where they are. Dundee have not been particularly convincing, I think, in 2024. I know the results maybe aren't that worse than they were kind of last year, but Dundee were a lot more impressive last year. This year, they've been a bit more fit to the start. Owen Beck's been... I think that's also kind of due to Owen Beck's injury as well. And then they're going away for home. It's the... I mean, it's a quote-unquote Tayside derby, which only St. Johnson believe in, but that means they should, they should be up for it more. They should be winning the game. and. They, they they end up losing it. I, I think a, a defeat was maybe a bit harsh on them. I think maybe a draw would have been the, the fairer result. But on the other hand, if Sidibe can replicate this performance consistently between now and the end of the campaign, then that's a player who could really help them. Like, he, he was so good. He, he, was, he was really, really good. Like, for somebody who looks about, what, 5'9", he was winning everything in the air. He was constantly, every time it went up to him, he made something happen. He was creating for the others. He was being a menace himself. His runs in behind were causing Dundee lots of problems. He was linking play pretty well as well. There was just like, it was kind of like a complete striker's performance other than the fact that he got kind of, he got a bit tired not long after his goal and ended up going off with about 15 to go. But yeah, just very, very impressed with, with how he played. And somebody that, I don't think we necessarily saw this coming when he arrived in, in Scottish football because he just came from the seventh tier of, of English football and you're thinking, hmm, if you're going to get up to speed, if you're going to be someday, it's going to take a while. Especially like in a striker role. You can't really think like, Joel Newblake came from like a similar level and he, and he went to our both for half a season and kind of worked his way up. And you, you see guys coming up and manage it to do stuff. George Harmon, I think at County, came from uh, the same level. But it's different when you're playing left wing back into where you're playing as, as a forward but no nah, he's, he's, he's already good he's already good it's, it's that sort of thing though and it's like it, it, you're looking at the need for a good striker in the run-in if you're going to fight off a chance of uh, potential relegation and it's like sorry the cat has just knocked over a lot of things here we'll just pick that up. <laughs> my humble apologies to you um yeah, so they signed Kim Pioca, obviously, as well. Mm-hmm. And he had a, a little bit of pedigree behind him, uh, you know, from the level that he's played at previously. He looked like a real handful, looked like a proper, you know, he could he could cause a lot of damage, scored a really good goal early on in his uh, St. Johnson tenure. And Sadibe was, was maybe the more understated signing uh, of, of the two strikers. But all they need is one to go on a run. And, and really, that, that's so important. Stevie May, obviously... Um, isn't there the player? What he's even shaved his head. Like it's just uh, it's, uh, it's marked the end of Stevie May, unfortunately. Um, and Nicky Clark is always going to be. He will always be Nicky Clark. He will always be a good foil for another striker to run off of, mm. try and get in the box and and put the ball in the back of the net. He's just a Scottish Premiership standard other guy, Nicky Clark. He's so good at it. And I feel like Sadibe and uh, Kim Pioca are, are the guys that are going to have to be the beneficiaries of this if St. Johnson are going to have a chance. But it's taken a, it's taken a <laughs> wild. <laughs> it's 
sorry. Uh, it's taken a wild, like incredible um, goal for him to get off the to get off the mark in St Johnston colours. But this could be the start of something, and that's got to be the hope now for St Johnston. They need to think, right? Okay, we've got this guy on the score sheet, so now we need to continue. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, buddy. <laughs> Rob's, uh, Rob's cat wants to get involved in the video for YouTube. Honestly, uh, Rudy's having a great time here. So, yes, um, they need that They need that talisman and the run-in. And I think that you're looking now towards the, the post-split fixtures for St. Johnson. They're going to be the really, really key ones. It's against the teams that they're, they're sort of fighting up against. They've got everyone in the bottom six is going to have to play Levy at some stage and they've got to be looking at that thinking this this could be an opportunity here Motherwell are going to be down on their luck and maybe thinking right what could have been they'll just be looking to nurse themselves to the end of the season Aberdeen could very well be in the same position so you're looking at your Ross County St Johnston those are the two that I think are really going to be fighting up against it and, and St Johnston are going to need a guy like Sidibe to pull moments like that out of the hat to give them that opportunity so yeah a, a wonderful goal didn't deserve to be on a team that, that ultimately lost the game. But you look at Dundee, and, and that's such an important three points for them. I, I think over the course of the season, they've been really entertaining. I'm going to say something nice about them as well. So they've been an entertaining team to watch. Really young team, which is good to see. And Tony Doherty, obviously, uh, cutting his teeth at Scottish Premiership level as well, has brought in guys like Baka Yoko, who I've really enjoyed watching this season, ultimately gets the winner. And he's, he's given more game time to guys like Lyle Cameron in the top flight and what a goal it was from Cameron as well. We won't talk about Damon Tarmitov because I really like him, but Cameron's finish in that was, was wonderful as well. Two great goals in this game. Yeah, it's, it's still a great finish. There's a lot to do in that situation. And in Scottish football, typically when that kind of thing happens, you usually see the ball sail wide over, do, do something that, that apart from going to the back of the net. I don't, it has to be said, though... <laughs> Another hilarious goal. Also, what was St. Johnson complaining about when it went in the back of the net? Right, so it looked like they were sort of like wanting the handball to get given against yeah. Mutov. It was like, yeah, like, no, I did handle it. Like They were like shouting to the ref, like, you were about to blow. Why didn't you blow? It was like, well, it was plain advantage. Like, that's, that's perfectly fine. What are you complaining about? An absolute, uh, an absolutely stunning advantage played as well because the ball went in. Like, it, yeah, it exactly. like great, great for the ref. Great. And uh, you look at it, I'm pretty sure that Mutov did handle it. Like, you know, when... Yeah, um, yeah. I can't remember exactly who, well, it might have been Bakayoko, but I can't remember who it was, was, was trying it to hit was. past him. And uh, Mitov, like, as a good goalkeeper does, spreads himself really well, um, obviously for getting his 40 yards outside of his own box. But no, a huge win for Dundee, and it puts them back in the driver's seat for, for top six, which, uh, you know, at the start of the season might not have been their aim, but they're there, and they're there on merit. Yes, uh, certainly. And I thought this one, kind of talking about subs, a couple of good subs from Tony Doherty, brought on Jordan McGee and Michael Mellon for, who was it went off? It was Scott Tiffany, I think. Scott Tiffany. And yeah, it was Tiffany and Dara Costello, who again, wing back. No. And that could have given him a bit of a lift because I thought that first half was fairly even, but St. Johnson really played well in the second half. I could up until they scored, it could have got a bit even again, but Dundee made the changes soon after the goal. And it, the sub helped. So Cameron had a good first half and he kind of fell out of it and then it kind of re-energised him. Him and Luke McCown both got into the game a bit more after they subs. And that's kind of where the goal comes as well from McCown with the, the cross for Bakioko. <sighs> Speaking of subs though, Craig Levine. Like, so Johnson got nothing on, on the wings. And, and I mean, they got nothing on the wings in their squad, really. But he does himself no favours. Like Tony Gallagher on one side and Max Kucheravi on the other side. Kucheravi and Matt Smith kind of trading places as well because neither of them like because Kucheravi's not not a wide player neither Smith so they had nothing they had nothing on that side and Gallagher was was trying on the other side but doesn't really have much talent as a wide player he's a, he's a fullback and not a particularly great one going forward at that and he doesn't bring off Carey like it's the biggest goal threat he doesn't bring him off until they go two one down and it's like like even after you've scored. He scored the 60th minute. Like, press home that advantage. Bring, bring on your best attacker. Like, instead, it's like, still trying to, like, yeah, a draw is a fine result. I don't know, like, I don't know if a draw is a fine result in this position that St. Johnson are in at the moment with Ross County looking like they're coming back to life. Like, St. Johnson aren't going to be able to draw their way out of this. They're going to have to win some football games. And to win some football games, you've got to be having guys like Carey on the park. I'm not even a huge Carey fan, but it's been undeniable that he's won them many points this season. Give him the chance to do it again. 
Who are you backing? The wily old Fox, Craig Levine, or the Highland James Bond, Don Cowie, uh, to, to get their team to safety here? Because right now, the momentum is with County, but the experience of Craig Levine will very possibly tell when it comes into the actual running. How, how do you see it going? I'm going to go with, rather than the, the experience against the experience, I'm just going to go with what I think is the better team, and I think that's Ross County. I think that because there's not a medal or a trophy at the end of it, then Craig Levine will prevail um, because there's nothing to actually win uh, at the end there. So. But if you, uh, if, uh, you might want to win a playoff final. Do you, do you not get in for that? <laughs> <laughs> there's no way There's no way you win something for that, is there? I think if, you're the, if, you're the you premiership, if you're the premiership side, surely not. If you're the, if you're the championship side, that would make sense. I don't but think like, you actually do win a trophy like they do in England. I think you just get like stood in front of like a, a placard being like Premiership Trophy winners or something. But Premiership a, playoff winners. Yeah, it's a video yeah. though. You're, you're the team that's nearly been relegated. But Craig, Craig, Craig Levine on the phone to, to a local um, Perthshire trophy <laughs> manufacturer. Can you please <laughs> listen? I just need I, honestly, I could do with twenty six medals, but just get one. Just get one for me. That's absolutely perfect. Yeah, no, I, I don't think. You would deserve to win anything uh, if if you're the Premiership team. We'll ask. Uh, we'll look at Ross County from last year. Do a research and see if they've got uh, any medals slung around their neck, or if it is just a a few badly made flags uh, that say Premiership pre- Premiership <laughs> Playoff winners. <laughs> right. Well, let's move on. Um, a couple of other games to to look at here. Um, maybe not the full focus that we gave the the Aberdeen game. We'll see. No. But we'll start. We'll start at Ibrox. Again, you know, what, what's become one of uh, my favourite rivalries in Scottish football between Rangers and Hibs. Just two teams that absolutely detest each other. I'm, I'm absolutely all for it. Do you know what, though? Do you know, do you know what? It's starting to lose its luster a bit because to, for, to remain a rivalry, Hibs have to start winning some of these games again. And I think it's been a while since I've... I think I'm right in saying that, unless there's any I'm forgetting off the top of my head. It feels like maybe the 2 old draw was the last time... Was that like early, early Lee Johnson? Was that the last time that they got a positive result against Rangers? I think, I think that so. th- this is more of a, a patter rivalry than sporting. Um, I think this is <laughs> this is to do with people being uh, maimed, uh, attacked on the pitch by fans. <laughs> uh, Ryan Porteous sliding through people, even though he's not there anymore, it could still happen. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very much uh, that sort of rivalry, but... Rangers ran out 3-1 winners uh, on the afternoon. I think it's the result that many expected. I know that Motherwell went to Ibrox a few weeks ago and, and gave Rangers a bloody nose on their own patch, but I feel like that will maybe be the outlier between now and the end of the season, maybe just a bit of a wake-up call for Philippe Clement and his side. Um, another game that, that had its VAR controversies, uh, which led to loads of added time, which led to eventually Cyril Dessers finally scoring the goal on his, like, his eighth opportunity once again. But Rangers went in the game. James Tavernier becoming the top scoring uh, defender in British football history. Uh, Mizzy and Malida once again showing that he is, has been a real top quality signing for Hibs. Uh, and Rabi Matondo scoring a screamer. So there, there's plenty to unpack from the game. Yes. And so I think the kind of interesting thing to this was kind of what the was a discussion in our group chat with Ewan kind of pointing out that he was just you and our, our resident Rangers fan was just kind of incredulous as to how Nick Montgomery sets his team up when he goes to Ibrox. And watching it back, yep, again, they were they were passing out by the, for the back. They were, I mean, not exactly kind of gung-ho. They weren't, like, committing too many bodies forward, but they, they were, you know, their attackers were getting forward. Their, their fullbacks occasionally were getting forward to provide some support. But it was more about the fact that they were just kind of, they were wide. They weren't, they weren't narrowly set up. They weren't like trying to force Rangers in, 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 uh, kind of trying to, to break them down. And it's whether that's the right tactic or not when you go to Ibrox. I mean, on the one hand, I mean, how many times have you seen Hearts go to Celtic or Rangers and be so defensive and get beat? And you're like, what was it, even the fucking point in that? Because well, it's, it's so often that they start defensive and can see the goal after five minutes. It's like, yeah. right, what are you going to do now? And yes. It's like... It, 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 there's no right or wrong way a lot of the time to set up when you go to Glasgow. I think a lot of the time you need to hope that the opposition have a bad day yeah. and then you can take advantage of it in that way. And yeah, it's it, it did it's, shite. Th- it's shite. And I, I hate that that's the case, but I feel like that is the case a lot of the time. Um, but again, 
playing it out from the back is maybe not advised uh, yeah. against the Rangers yeah, to be, team. To like be this. fair, we playing out the back. That kind of helped with the goal because your point in playing out for the back is then you get like if you get through the press, you're going to have options further up the park. You're going to have more space, and that is what happened. But I think with the Hibs, to be fair, both teams are a bit similar on this in that. So, like Hibs sometimes had the ball in advanced areas and just didn't really use it very well. Didn't didn't create an awful lot apart from the goal. But you could also say that Rangers were the same, especially down Hibs is right, and I couldn't really figure out why. But down, like, it seemed like every single attack, other than, funnily enough, the goal scored by Dessers, which came from a cross from Cantwell from the right, it seemed like every single Rangers attack was going down the left. And Rangers weren't making enough of it. I think maybe why is because Fabio Silva was out there, and so they don't really have a natural wide player there. If it was maybe a, a Dallas Sedima, who it's, it's Sedima. Abdallah Sima, who is now back fit again, came off the bench after his kind of long injury absence. If he was fit enough to start and if he was kind of up to speed as he was in the campaign, it might have been a lot worse for Hibs. But it was just kind of two teams having opportunities in the final third. Obviously, Rangers having a lot more to create stuff and not just quite finding the, the right pass or the right ball. But obviously, Rangers still deserve easily to win the game because they had, well, there was a penalty. I mean, we could talk about the penalty. Penalty seemed soft as fuck but then like Dessers had a great chance there was another one Tav had a shot who went just wide there was another couple of opportunities as well Rangers could have racked up the goals in this one and maybe it could have been to the point where you're looking at it and if you're you're talking about this question about Montgomery when it's 3-1 it's kind of fine like we, we had a bit of a go it's fine we lost 3-1 but Rangers could have won this by more and if you're losing by 5-1 then you're thinking right okay when you stop doing this so we can stop getting embarrassed yeah, it's, it's profligate finishing rather than a, a tactical mm. masterclass, which has kept yeah. the, uh, the the scoreline down. Uh, yeah, very quickly on the penalty, I don't think it is. Um, no. I, I don't think it is a penalty. He's, he's gone up for a header and, and the other guy has not, and it's just a, a coming together. It's nonsense. Um, it's, it's what I've said before about this, is that one of the many, many things to hate about VR, but something that I don't think enough people are talking about, because maybe some people like it, because you used to always get people moaning before, saying like, so basically, it's it's created more penalties because fouls inside the box that would never be penalties before. Penalties used to have to be like there was a different standard Obvious. of foul. Yeah, there yeah. was a different standard of foul which applied to penalties that didn't apply anywhere else in the park. People say, "Well, well, of course it's a penalty because if, you, if that happened on the halfway line, it would be a foul." And you're thinking, "Yeah, but I don't want that. I don't want a penalty for every <laughs> for every minor infringement that it would just be given by a referee at the halfway line." And yet, because you kind of have to apply the rules, like VR's meant that these things are now given as penalties and these things massively change games and they're always likely to come down on the side that's the underdog. So it just ends up benefiting Celtic and Rangers in the long run, especially Rangers, because like the the Hibs tweet suggested, they they, they just constantly get penalties. Yeah, um, I absolutely Call a spade a spade, they're they're getting penalties all the time. (laughs) I'm not saying it's biased, but they are getting penalties all the time. So do Celtic. I think Celtic have, have got more penalties so far this season than, than Rangers have. So, you know, there you go. They both get that, loads of penalties. Right? Uh, I was certainly right when there was a, like, Rangers were getting loads, but I'm pretty sure Celtic had had more. So it was like, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not fact-checked, but um, uh, if, if, I, if I talk for 30 seconds, Craig, I'm sure you can fact-check that uh, while we're... Okay, while okay. We're, good. Um, <laughs> just wanted to mention uh, um, Nectarius Gentis uh, smashing two of his players in the head with one free kick, by the way. One of the, be- one of the best things I've ever seen in my life. Uh, Joe, Newell, Joe Newell and Will Fish uh, getting, getting just been knocked clean out by one free kick from their own player in his own half, um, and the ball just sort of going back and sitting nicely uh, on the stomach of, of Joe Newell uh, at the end there as well. A real highlight. Yeah, my, my sympathies with Newell, not so much with Fish. Grow up. That can't yeah, hurt that much. If it's already rebounded off the face of your teammate and you're like 10 yards away. It was I'm very, not, I'm uh, not having that. I'm not having that at all. It was very Hollywood, very platoon uh, death style uh, fall <laughs> from, from Will Fish there. But yeah, what, what an incredible moment uh, in oh, the game yeah. Rabbit. Do you know what? They're, they're even. Celtic and Rangers, 13 each. Yes. So a good shout. Told you. And if Celtic had got the one that they should have got against Livingston, they would have had yeah. more. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're not talking about that game yet. Let's move on to uh, Tynecastle Park, a game that, that we were both at. Hart and Lothian won. Uh, Kilmarnock won. Kenneth Fargas scoring his eighth goal of the season. Marley Watkins scoring a wonder goal for his 12th of the season. 
I don't think there's a huge amount to talk about with Hearts here, um, but I think there is some to talk about with Kelly. Um, I, I've I've really really enjoyed watching Kelly when I've seen them this season because they're just such a bastard of a team to play against, and there's so much to appreciate with that. The back four is solid as fuck in the midfield. You've got proper exciting players like David Watson, obviously Dan Armstrong, and uh, and, and Matty Kennedy. Sometimes playing in that wing back role, but obviously sometimes just playing as the wide midfielders, and then Kyle Vassell. Just a, a great big lump with a phenomenal touch who brings players into it. Yeah, one of the best teams I've seen at Tyne Castle this season. Well worth their point, could potentially have been worth more than that because yeah. uh, they, they really put so much into the game. Yeah, you could... Kind of going back to your intro, you could probably praise them. The most I could praise them is actually doing it through a Hearts lens and saying that I don't actually think Hearts played that badly and I think they were the second best team on the day because I just think Kelly played that well. Yeah, I, I think you're. I think you're right. And and looking at the, the the games that we've played at Tyne Castle this season, no one, as as long as I'm remembering correctly, I think Celtic absolutely did us in in one game, and that's basically mm-hmm. been it. The other game we beat Celtic at Tyne Castle. Rangers only scraped a one 0 win at Tyne Castle. Two draws with Hibs, beating Aberdeen. Could be by uh, honestly, was that? Could be by Motherwell. No one remembers that, Craig. No one remembers <laughs> that. We're still in Europe at the time, does it count? We were, uh, exactly, it doesn't count. But no, I, I think that's the most impressed I've been with an opposition team at Tyne Castle this season. Uh, you expect it from Celtic when they beat us 4-1. Uh, the Callum Slattery winning goal at, at Tyne Castle was a bit of a non-event. I thought Motherwell were fine in that game. Yeah. I thought Kelly, the amount of chances they created and just see the quality of delivery into the box is unbelievably good. It's so good. And Matty Kennedy is maybe someone that I didn't appreciate enough quite how good he was um, in, in terms of getting the ball into the box. Dan Armstrong, we know yeah. when he gets onto his left foot, he's going to put it into an area that is almost impossible to defend against sometimes. But Kennedy, I thought had, Len Makisa had a really tough time mm. up against Matty Kennedy, a really tough time. Uh, but that's because Kennedy changes it up. He was going wide, uh, sorry, he was going touchline or he was coming back onto his right or he was going in field or he was playing a, a sort of cutback. He's completely unpredictable. Uh, and he, he played he played such a great game. And at, at, at the back, like, Lewis Mayo, Robbie Dees, like, these guys are, are just superb. Lauren yes. Shankland had nothing uh, to, to, to basically go against them with. And yeah, I, I th- what you said about Hearts playing all right, I thought they were all right. I thought but the first half especially had some really good movement, uh, some good moves that, that just, don't, just didn't end up in proper opportunities, I think. But was, again, a, a lot of that was... That, there was a few players that really fell off. Like, I don't think there was anybody that bad in the first half, but then in the second half, Grant really fell off. Macaulay Tate fell off, which you can maybe expect considering his age. Vargas and Forrest, and they kicked their backside in the second half. So it was just kind of that. It was a number of players who just didn't really kind of show up in the in the second period. But even then, before Watkins kind of bent that in the top corner, I was starting to think Hearts managed, was managing to get a bit of control of the game. And then that happened, and then it was like, hmm, I was getting a bit worried. I was like, if one team's winning this, it's going to be Kelly. Yeah, 100%. I think I'd, I felt that even when it was still 1-0 at Hearts for a little while. I think they, they, <laughs> like, honestly, they, they, they flashed like three headers past the post. I think they hit the crossbar. Superb save for Xander Clark, we should say. Xander Gordon-esque. Clark made a, a very Craig Gordon-esque save reaction, just sort of tipping it uh, from, from behind himself. That was the, the last action in the first half. But no, I, I think a, a massive fair play to Kelly and to Derek McInnes. He's, he's doing to them what he, he did with Aberdeen with leaner resources at Kilmarnock. And you can see they're, they're worthy of their place uh, in, in fourth position right now. I think they will finish fourth. Um, you look at the, the strength and the sort of, yeah, the, the run that they're having just now. And by the way, it's worth saying as well, they've not been great away from home this season. And that was a yeah. really good performance away from home, which again, it shows that maybe that's something else that is a, a, another string to their bow uh, sort of coming to the running. And one player that I, I, I mentioned um, and, and how well he played the last time we talked about Kelly, which was the, would have been the St. Mern game. But Liam Donnelly, again, you kind of see him in person being like, are you the, like, talk about like the job that McInnes has done. It's always, it always goes towards praising a manager when you see players being turned into something that you thought they weren't. And I didn't think Liam Donnelly was any good as a defensive midfielder. And yet, the last few months, he's been excellent. And I thought he was good again at Tynecastle. And seeing him in the flesh kind of just kind of hit home. Like, McInnes has actually turned into you know, a decent Scottish Premiership player. And I don't think even Kilmarnock fans thought that was possible earlier in the season. 
it's it's what good man management does to to players that are clearly at clubs in the top flight for a very good reason. Mm -hmm. They maybe don't show it a lot of the time. Yes. And I think that, that you know, I'd, I'm going to say there's countless examples of that. I literally don't have any off the top of my head. But it, it's <laughs> feel like, bear. <laughs> feel bear. Jesus Christ. Right. Okay. There's one straight away. But there's an example, like, obviously, we always go back to Brendan Rodgers' first spell in charge of yeah. Celtic and Callum McGregor, Kieran Tierney, James Forrest, all these guys that basically became, like, superstars at Scottish Premiership level because they had an actual manager who understood how to play to their strengths. And, you know, Derek McInnes showed at Aberdeen. He's shown it again now that he can get the very, very best out of the players that are at his disposal. And, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to turn this into a, a, a one-team in Ayrshire podcast, uh, but I will say that... I was very impressed with Kilmarnock and I'm not looking forward to playing them again after the split. And no. that is a, a nice little way to mention that they have confirmed themselves as top six, uh, which again, great achievement. Uh, and we're just expecting St Mirren and AN other to now sort of make up the, the, the rest of that. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Liam Donnelly uh, being a, 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 a midfielder. This is shit. We're going to play fill in the blanks and there's another <laughs> midfielder that made his comeback uh, at the weekend there. Well, Thanks, like Craig. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. <laughs> Basically, what we're saying is midfielders, they're fun. Let's do Yay! something else. Um, so, yeah, fill in the blanks uh, is the next part of the podcast. We're going to go to Almond Vale, uh, as it will be called again soon, unless they get some other wacky sponsor, because the Tony Macaroni will be dead at the end of this season. Not the franchise. I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, reasonably priced pasta will still be a thing, but the stadium won't be. Uh, so, fill in the blanks. Rio Hatate's return to Celtic starting 11 is... Potentially title defining. Can I say mine straight after? Yes. Uh, I think uh, Rio Hatate's return to the Celtic starting 11 is uh, not going to solve any of their problems. It's a lot deeper than that. And it has been, it has been all season. It's not about individual players. It is very much about the, the, the malaise, the standards at the club dipping this season compared to last. And Rio Hatate, a very, very fine footballer. I love watching him play. I don't think he's going to be the difference. Let's, let, let, you, you fight your side. I see your point. I see your point. I, I think it's not just a tie. I think it's it's putting that midfield three back together, and it should be back together next week. That is what the chat is coming at the Celtic camp that Callum McGregor would not be risked for this one. He will, however, be fit for the Old Firm game next Sunday. And so you're right. The vibes have been off in Celtic all season. Obviously, the vibes weren't great at Rangers to start with with Michael Beale in charge, and they've been massively improved since Philippe Clement came in. And yeah, maybe if Clement was in charge the entire season, then this would already be done and dusted. However, when I still look at the, both squads, so both squads have got problems with them throughout the team, really. Less so Rangers. Rangers midfield is, is good, but they've got problems out in the wing because they've just had a, a kind of number of injuries. Sima is coming back. That will certainly help them, but I'm still not entirely sure who they'd go with on the right. At centre half, John Souter has been playing a lot better recently, but I don't, I still don't really fancy him. And Goldson is a combination that you would normally think would win you a title. And Souter always just seems that far, like close to, to making a mistake. On the other side, Celtic have got issues where they've got certainly got the second best keeper out of the two clubs. They've got their own problems at centre half themselves with Liam Scales alongside Cameron Carter Vickers, not quite the, the same as Carl Starfelt. And they've also kind of looking at the attack. Rangers have got the attack. Centre forward's a bit of an issue. It's getting better because Des, Desus is continuing to, to play better as the season's going along. But if he goes through on goal against Celtic on Sunday, do you back up the score? No, you don't. Celtic have got Kyogo, who if, he, if Rogers could continue just to play him as a centre forward and not try to do much else with him, then they should be fine. But that, that remains to be seen. And they've got, also got problems out wide. So I think in terms of talent and in terms of the problems in each team, the clubs are fairly well matched. Where I think Celtic have the upper hand is I think that midfield three of O'Reilly, McGregor and Hatati is just the best group of collection of players that play in one position in the entirety of Scottish football. And, and also, as I've been saying as well, I think Brendan Rodgers, and you can tell this from the fact that he's now talking at his backside a lot in press conferences, has woken up to the fact that he might not win this title. And if he doesn't win this title with Celtic, that is a huge black mark on his res resume. And I think that's the main thing he cares about rather than actually caring about Celtic themselves. Oh, and yeah. The, like, but he's, never gonna make it, he's never going to make it back to England if he gets sacked by Celtic because Rangers win a title. And I don't think he will necessarily get sacked this summer, but if they start off poorly again next season and Rangers take the early advantage of the title race, 
then it's seriously it's asking questions of whether Brendan Rodgers is going to be sacked by Celtic. That happens. He's never gone back to the English Premier League without going to the English Championship first and getting somebody promoted. So, and that will be a, that's a long route back. So I think he's woken up now. I think there's maybe a bit more. It, it didn't show in the first half. Like Celtic were again so passive, like so lacking it in intensity and urgency. But we've seen this game so many times this season where like they just kind of switched on in the second period, got a, got a bit of a got a bit of a fluky goal to start with, but then just ran away with it and scored three goals. And it seems like we've seen this show before. Rangers still need to prove that they can beat Celtic. And I, if Celtic's midfield is back in place, and you could say, well, our, our, is Hattati and McGregor? McGregor should be fine. He's only been out for a couple of weeks. But is Hattati going to be up to speed? I thought Hattati was pretty good on Sunday. So he didn't look like he's missed too much. Probably not going to be at his very best. But that is just having them back together. If they can stay threat for the rest of the campaign that could swing the title race back to Celtic. I'm not saying it's going to, but it certainly could. Just uh, jumping back to Brendan Rodgers being in it for Brendan Rodgers, not for Celtic. He seems like the sort of guy that would name his fantasy football team Brendan Rodgers. <laughs> <laughs> or if he, if, if he was doing a quiz, if he was doing a pub quiz, it's like, oh, what's a, what's a wacky team name we can come up with? I like Brendan Rodgers as a team name. Okay, that's fine, Brendan. We'll, we'll do that then. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, he's, he's absolutely in it for himself. I think he always has been uh, throughout his career. Liverpool, oh, yeah, Celtic, two, two of the biggest teams in the UK. I don't care. It's all about me. Um, my Yeah, you, you've kind of covered what I was going to say about it, which is my point of view is Cal McGregor, Rio Hitate especially, um, are very, very used to and married to the style of play that Ange Postacoglu wanted to play uh, for the past two seasons. They've not been able to really jump out of that, which means that essentially when they are playing... They don't have that much of an idea of what to do other than, can you please be a good midfielder? Um, Matt O'Reilly is uh, a, a talent beyond that, and I think that he's been good enough on the whole to, to, to basically push past it and just still be a top-class footballer, whereas I think that Philip Clement at Rangers has got them playing a style of play that every single player understands and likes, which means that when it comes to the run-in, that harmony of the squad, playing as a whole, is going to be more important than an individual player, Rio Tate coming in and being able to change the entire direction, the entire vibe at a, at a football club in a starting eleven, and how they go forward with that. So that's that's where I was coming from, but you basically covered it off there. Regardless, not much to say about Livingston anymore. Um, they're going down. The first the first goal is so frustrating because you, you get it to half time and you're, you're actually thinking like one kind of swan song, one kind of final time that they stick it to Celtic as they have done surprisingly a number of times since coming up to the Scottish Premiership. And then it's just like so early into the half and it's just Stephen Bradley, get that ball up the park. What are you doing? Like for that point, it's just a bit unlucky. And it's really, I really felt sorry for Shamal George who had a shocker for the third goal. Would you like, just save it with your legs, man. Like don't, don't try to throw your body down that, that quickly. But for the, the first goal, he actually makes a really, really good save and he's not had a good season. And it's like, that, that's the kind of thing that can really do your confidence. Really keep that out, you know, keep frustrating Celtic a bit longer. Even if they end up getting beat, that's something you can look back on and go, well, but immediately just comes back and hits Jamie Bradley and goes in. It's just like... But yeah, so far, like, Bradley needs to just get rid of that ball. And it's just so many times this campaign, as I've said numerous, I'm kind of repeating myself again, but Livy, they've just, for a team that needs to be difficult to beat, they've just shot themselves in the foot far too often. I feel like Livy have had uh, such little airtime given their uh, malaise at the bottom of the, the table that people on Twitter are like, oh, Shamal George is a great goalkeeper. Why is he still at Livingston? And you're like, you've not watched him enough this season, have you? And he's, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that big guy. Um, I, I kind of mentioned the penalty as well. I think it was a penalty on Kyogo. He gets kicked. Um, so yeah, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. And yeah, Celtic did enough. Bernardo um, can clearly hit them from distance. Uh, mm. So he should do that way more often because he's, he's obviously very adept at it. But listen, the, both sides of the old firm, it was, it was results um, that we expected. And next week is just so massive. I can't wait to watch it. It's an old firm game that I'm genuinely looking forward to watching. So often, I feel like in recent years, it's been kind of like, right, in what minute are Rangers going to fuck this up and the uh, Celtic are going to score? But I feel like this has got a... Uh, so much riding on it, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that one next week. We have one more game to discuss, and it was played at Fur Park. So let's play a little bit of over under. Theo Bear over or under 15 and a half goals, 15.5 this season. He is on 12 now for the campaign, which is remarkable. It's amazing seeing mm. him grow to becoming like a genuinely interesting and exciting to watch centre forward from what he was at 
St Johnston uh, a substitute. So yeah, seeing him sort of go from uh, one end of the spectrum to the other, he got another goal, um, not quite. Not quite as good as a few of the goals he scored this season. He just threw his massive frame at it and hoped that it would bounce off him and go into the back of the net. It did. But will he get another four goals this season, Craig Fowler? Four goals in eight games. It is a, it is a tall order. A tall order for, for any striker, really, in the league. And especially one who would, would just written off his shit up until late December. <laughs> it's, not even, it's not even this season. It's like, even at the start of this season, we're like, yeah, he's leading the line for Mother, but he's not, still not any good. But I, I think he's going to do it. So for two reasons. One, I was just so impressed. Like I only watched the highlights for this one, but I was just so impressed with the fact that he's now just, he's just there all the time. Like when he was kind of sco- when he first started to score, it just kind of seemed like a bit of a fluky thing. But now he's just, it's one of those ones where you get a player gets confidence, and it also seems to make them more intelligent. Like that confidence, like the the, the belief in yourself to score a goal means that maybe you're more likely to put yourselves in situations where you can score goals and you're not afraid of missing. Or maybe they, just the fact that you've got belief in yourself clears your head. And so then you just kind of have feel the game more, get that instinct of where to stand, where to run, when to peel off, et cetera, et cetera. Because if anybody was going to score from other one in this game, it was going to be Theo Bear. And it just kind of sh- further highlights his huge development as a player this season from the guy who was just like absolutely guff at St. Johnson. And yeah, so I think, and, uh, yeah, the second reason, Motherwell are going to be fine. They are not going to, they'll pretty much, you know, confirm their safety, I imagine, uh, one or two games after the split, and they will play some meaningless end-of-season games, and meaningless end-of-season games are weird, and weird things happen. So I really wouldn't be entirely surprised if Theo Bear doesn't score in seven of the eight remaining games and scores four goals in one game. Uh, when the season's done and dusted <laughs> in like a five-all draw with Aberdeen that's yes. it yeah 100 percent not that's uh, I, that's basically what I was going to say I think he will do it as well because of the mad end of season matches that he's going to be playing in and and the complete unpredictability of what happens in in these games mind when Hibs and Rangers drew five all on the last day of the season like that's the sort mm-hmm. of stuff that we're going to be seeing Jamie McLaren score on a hat trick what so yeah, we're going to see Theo Bear um, scoring. I, I, I think he will finish on like sixteen, maybe even seventeen goals, just because it's got that feeling about it. He's in a real rich vein of form, and I, I think he'll be able to knock it in the back of the net enough uh, against the teams that will be in the bottom six alongside them. Any words on St Mirren other than the? Uh... Yeah, no, I've got some words. So I think that Stephen Robinson should take a wee bit of the blame for them not winning this one. And that I think his use of substitutes wasn't all that great. I mean, they still might have drawn anyway. I don't want to be too harsh on the guy. But like he took off Caelan Boyd Munts, who was, I think he's, it's a bit of favouritism. And also, I mean, Marco Harris is our captain, so you can understand it. But Boyd Munts has been better than O'Hara this season. And it helps them maintain a bit of control in the midfield area because he's a very good passer of the ball. O'Hara did help them kind of maintain control before just from his kind of like physical abilities, his energy charging up and down. But O'Hara's not been, for whatever reason, just not played well, especially in 2024. First half of the season wasn't too bad. Kind of since the turn of Rio, kind of generally quite poor. And yet he takes off Boyd Munson and keeps O'Hara on. Mm, not sure about that. And he started with Toyosa Olasanya. Somebody who usually you just want to kind of bring off the bench. But you start with him. Olasanya had one of his best starts of the season, probably. And he takes him off with half an hour to go when he's actually kind of threatening and, and brings on Conor McMenamin, who McMenamin was good off the bench when they beat Aberdeen. But generally, since the first two months, six weeks, two months of the campaign, where he looked really good, he's not done much at all. and. Again, a, a bit of a strange sub that, that weakened his own side. And just something to... Not, not really a kind of wider point about this, just something that, that I noticed for this one that I thought was, was a little bit strange. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fair enough. And obviously, um, St Mirren and Kelly being the other guys, uh, essentially, in, in the top six this season, that's, that's not to belittle them at all. I think it's, it's brilliant to see how, how both of these teams have, have actually grown from last season, I would say, a little bit as well. I think St Mirren have improved. Uh, even from a, a very impressive, especially into last season when O'Hara was scoring goals for fun 
Um, and, and I think a lot of that is down to Stephen Robinson, you know, being able to, to bring in guys like, Boy, like, you know, bring in guys that are going to essentially maintain where they are uh, in the league, if not try and aim for a, a little bit higher and, and, and sort of aim for that fourth position. But yeah, I, I think that so often Scottish Premiership games can be decided on uh, a little bit of favouritism potentially or, or, mm. or just try to shoehorn a guy back into the team because he's your guy. Um, yeah, and, you've, and, you've spent 125 grand on him. That's in the case of McMenamin. Yeah, well, that I mean, that's kind of it. You know, you, you're wanting to prove to yourself that, that this is the case. And these little things get picked up a lot more easily than they do like south of the border and, and whatever. But yeah, St. Mirren, it's been another really good season for them. And again, like, you know, going to Fir Park and getting a draw is indicative of that. It's still a decent result. You know, mm. being able to go there and, yeah. and, and take a point away and then a, a, a home game next week up against uh, up against Hearts, which will be massive, you know, a, a yeah, proper opportunity at the, at the home stadium. Going to, yeah, I think they're going to confirm their their top six spot next week, unfortunately. Nah, nah, I don't think so. I think they're going to lose 6-0. So I think yeah. uh, if, if, <laughs> if you look at it that way, I think... We'd love uh, to see it. We're not, uh, Stephen Robinson is not going to storm towards you on the street uh, like he did with St Mirren fans uh, having a go at them for, for, for having a go at him. Uh, I, th- I think that he will probably admit himself uh, that, that it wasn't the, the best managed game. But even then, he's got so much credit in the bank, deservedly so, yes. for what he's done at the club this season. Craig Feller, do you have anything more to say? No, I believe we, we've covered it all, literally all of it. Every blade of grass has been covered mm. on this uh, Monday's edition of the Terrace Scottish Football Podcast. Thank you all very much for tuning in as ever. Um, if you don't follow our Patreon, then please do. Uh, we punt it literally every single day and there's so much content on there, uh, you couldn't swing a cat in it. So yeah, please uh, have a look at that. Get involved in the, the Discord if, if you're a part of that as well. And yeah, just keep uh, keep sending us nice tweets or mean tweets, it doesn't really matter. All we care about is engagement. <laughs> All we care about is numbers. Death threats are fine as well. And if you want a petrol us, I will send you my home address but Craig Feller for time being thank you very much thank you very much I just got um, for the YouTube I just got Nacho involved because Rudy was involved in earlier so I just thought didn't want to leave Nacho out do you know what it's great uh, I just realised I've come straight from Mark somewhere in a Hearts hoodie I had a Hearts yeah. mug on uh, earlier on and there's a cat called Rudy here so I could not <laughs> honestly I'll just like I'll touch I'll turn the laptop around and there'll be Hearts wallpaper uh, and Hearts bedsheets uh, I just uh, well, realised I hope, I hope you have a good night's sleep in your Hearts jammies I just realised how that all looked. But yes, thank you all very much for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye.